like you're going to stay here in this body. We're going to praise the Lord. You know, so that's how I, that's how I encourage Say that a little louder. Say that again. <laughs> the people in the back. For the people, people in the back. You have to speak to that illness. Speak yeah. to that illness. Hello and welcome to another edition of Overcoming Illness. I'm Paula Jenincourt, your host, founder, and CEO of Enrich Your Health. I am a holistic health coach. I decided to do this show um, because of people that have different um, illnesses and their stories that need to be heard. And people need help coping with these illnesses. It can be illnesses like we're going to discuss tonight, Lyme disease, could be cancer, congestive heart failure, um, you name it. We've had all kinds of guests. If you've not seen any of the shows, I encourage you to go back and watch them on Elevation TV Network. Go over to their YouTube channel. It's Elevation TV Network and give them some love on there. Give them a like, subscribe to their channel, and then subscribe to my channel while you're um, over on YouTube. So you can do that by going to um, Enrich Your Health, E-N-R-I-C-H, and then you are H-A-L-T-H. That's my um, YouTube channel, as well as Elevation TV Network, who gives us this platform. So um, I help my clients stop living a life of pain and suffering with simple diet tips, recipes. I have simple recipes on my website, um, and I can customize them. So I am looking for people to partner with practitioners, doctors, yoga people, um, alternative practitioners, anyone who has clients or patients, who when you hear them say, I don't know what to eat, I'm allergic to everything, that was me. <laughs> I suffered from multiple food allergies, so I can help with that. I can give simple recipes and changes um, where they're not overwhelmed with so many different options. There's a million things on the internet, I get it, but I'd like to make it simple. And so you um, have recipes for yourself, that are dairy-free, gluten-free, sugar-free, so that it brings down inflammation in the body and has gives you less pain in your body and can help with those food allergies and sensitivities, less bloating even. Um, I do want to also thank my sponsor this month, Paula Resendez of um, Trainer um, Supplements. If you need some help digesting your food, getting some good quality vitamins in, good quality B vitamins, we've been talking about them every single go back and watch some of the shows um, and her information is up on the screen so you can get that there um, without further ado I am really 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 super excited to have my guest tonight Larry Dapsis he is an entomologist from Cape Cod Cooperative Extension he's been an entomologist since the age of five <laughs> can you even imagine um, Bachelor's of Science degree in Environmental Science and Biology at Fitchburg State University, and that's in Massachusetts, and MS Entomology at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. 43 years of professional pest management experience, including vegetables, cranberries, and household insects. Joined Cape Cod Cooperative Extension in 2011 as Deer Tick project coordinator and entomologist and is a member of the Barnstable County Task Force on Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. And for those of you watching worldwide, Barnstable County is in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. So his additional responsibilities include invasive species monitoring, master gardener support, insect identification, and as a general resource for the county, Educational areas include prevention of tick-borne diseases, insect evolution, pollination, ecology, pest management, general entomology, forensic entomology, and edible insects. Okay, Larry, that bio is really testing my abilities with my grammar. But welcome, and welcome to Overcoming Illness. So, Larry, tell us a but, little but bit. It'll, 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 make you a, it'll make you a star. It'll make you a star on Scrabble. <laughs> All those words make you a Scrabble right. star. You know, you and get those into your left one. You could close out a game in three moves. <laughs> 
right? So, Larry, tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew so, Paula, up. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Sure. I am a Massachusetts native. I grew up in the central part of the state, and I was born in a city. And I stayed most of my most of my um, early years, and then uh, when I became eighteen and decided on you know college, and I was thinking of different. I I knew at age five that I was going to be a scientist that that flat out I just didn't know what kind of scientists I mean I had an interest in you know insects but the, the natural sciences overall but also you know um, it, it, I wanted into geology and I wanted to you know think about NASA at the time because Gemini and the Apollo programs were big when I was a kid so so I knew I was going to be in the sciences, but um, when I decided to um, go someplace that I could <laughs> afford as a young, poor kid, uh, Berg State came to light, and I uh, entered their uh, biology and environmental sciences program, and I took a strong interest in uh, surface water ecology. In fact, I had a big internship with the Nashua River Watershed Association where we were looking at indicator organisms as uh, as and different species of insects and other uh, invertebrates as indicators of water quality. So that was a, a really interesting one. But then um, I decided when I was finishing up that I did want to go to graduate school. And then I, you know, you have to kind of pick a specialty there. And it looked like at the time going into entomology for me made a lot of sense. And uh, so I wound up going to Mass Amherst and uh, started out in vegetable crop entomology in the arena of interest management. So, at, you know, um, looking at basically insect life cycles as they pertain to crop production and looking for weak links in life cycles and trying to figure out, you know, what what the rational approaches should be for managing all these serious things that uh, can impact, you know, our ability to <laughs> supply food. And so I, I did that for about three and a half years and then uh, entered the workforce. And, uh, and, and I entered the workforce at a bad time. There was a <laughs> big recession and, uh, and so the opportunities weren't many, but I wound up going into consumer product development. So, you know, products that people could buy to control insects in their households, like cockroaches and flies and fleas and whatnot. So I did that for a few years with a couple couple different companies, including uh, Black Flags. So for you, for you baby boomers out there in the United States, you may, you may remember that brand of products. And I am the father of the new and improved Roach Motel. Okay. <laughs> but then, then it became time to, uh, in my mind, get a, get a real entomology job. And that's when I joined Ocean Spray Cranberries, where I started out as the bug guy for North America, covering covering um, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, Washington, Oregon, and, and British Columbia, and, and a little bit in Quebec. And so I, I was at Ocean Spray for 24 years, but um, wow. at, after 24 years, the only, the only thing I didn't do was make juice. And so, um, so then my career path made a hard left turn from agriculture into public health. And that's when I joined Cape Cod Cooperative Extension as the entomologist. So my responsibilities are for the general public. I cover ants to yellow jackets. And that's kind of a broad <laughs> responsibility. But I, I have not been stumped yet on, on any bug problem. Big fish and it really important in the southeastern Massachusetts and uh, many areas of the United States and and other countries is the prevention of tick-borne diseases like Lyme. And in Massachusetts, um, we are endemic not only for Lyme but um, with these deer ticks, four other significant diseases that these ticks can transmit, and and that's just one of the ticks that. Uh, people have to deal with here, but but it goes well outside the the borders of Cape Cod. This is um, Lyme mm -hmm. is something that's uh, 
uh, endemic in a uh, hundred different countries around the world. So it's not only through North America to varying degrees, um, but also uh, it's an up and coming big problem in, in Europe and Western Asia um, and certain parts of uh, Asia, Southeast Asia. Oh. Oh, didn't know that. Yeah, so Lyme Lyme is actually out there in a in a bigger um, bigger coverage. It's just that the medical community, you know, hasn't really kept pace with the the people again. I mean, because uh, we can a bunch of other diseases, as you know, Paula. So um, so the, Lyme is occurring in places where it's just. Um, not recognized, and that's that's true here. Getting a um, uh, correct diagnosis of Lyme disease is, is kind of a tricky thing. There's there's just not right. a good mousetrap for that, and uh, that's why uh, prevention is is the key. That's the that's the foundation of the program I manage. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So we, I love your tie. <laughs> Thank you. Am I overdressed? <laughs> Not at all. That was a, that was a gift occasion. from one of my. That was a gift from one of my one of my workshop fans. Mm hmm. Well, that was a cute little gift. <laughs> so back up a little bit. Um, growing up, did anybody um, influence you in studying bugs? Actually, the big influence for studying in insects came from a couple different places. Um, mm -hmm. One is, as a kid, I used to just collect things that were cool, that looked interesting. Uh, you know, I because back when I was a kid, we didn't have computers, we didn't have the internet, we did not have cable television. So I spent a lot of my time outdoors. Uh, so I was hanging around the woods and meadows. And and swan uh, and and i would observe lots of uh, you know nature i was a naturalist um at a young age and mm -hmm. and i would i would basically collect stuff and bring it home interesting looking leaves and rocks and occasionally i'd collect bugs in jars and take them home and look at them for a while and let them go but but um one one summer i was seeing some things appear on bushes that that at the time they looked kind of like styrofoam, even though styrofoam was just invented when I was, you know, a six-year-old kid. But they look cool, so I I would break them off the bushes, bring them home, toss them on my bureau. And uh, I was in the first grade, and one day I was coming home from school, and my mom was waiting on the front porch, and then I heard. Lawrence Joseph Dapsis, get your butt in this house right oh, now. No. And when you hear all three of your proper names in one sentence, Polly, you know what that means. That means oh, yeah. it's time for a staff meeting. And my mom escorted me to my room, collected, were praying mantis cases, and back at the same time. And so around my room, my bureau, the walls, the ceiling, there were hundreds of little baby praying mantises that were walking oh. around looking for their first meal, like a fruit fly or something. And I oh. thought it was the coolest thing I had ever seen. Yeah, hundreds of praying mantises. And uh, I was, you know, the luckiest kid in the world until my mom took out the vacuum cleaner and took care oh. of what she perceived to be a problem in the household so that was the end of my um my my housemates for a while but i think that did have a lasting impression upon me um when i was uh finishing up my biology degree at fitchburg state i had taken entomology along with um, a lot of other zoology courses and and whatnot and, and i still wasn't exactly sure what i was gonna do with it mm -hmm. But I had a really good advisor, um, and he got his PhD at Cornell in plant physiology. And uh, we were chatting about graduate school, and he told me that when he was at Cornell, there was a department of entomology, then one of their specialties, because um, he used to run into this 
group of scientists all the time. And he said, there's a thing called integrated pest management, Larry, IPM. And he said, if you go into a degree in entomology and integrated pest management, not only you, might you have a job in a very specific field, but um, some can make some money, um, some good job opportunities. And when I look into entomology and, and pest management, I saw a big, big world in front of me. And, uh, and so I started out in agriculture thinking, you know, well, everybody has to eat. And I grew up, you know, um, as a lot of people did, immigrant families, a lot of my family's background, we, we farmed, uh, we farmed up, um, I'm, I'm really the first generation in my family that didn't grow up uh, on a farm or farming, but I've got a lot of farming behind me. And uh, so, uh, so it, uh, I had a great appreciation for, for agriculture at an early age, just because of, you know, that's where our family came from. And uh, so, so starting vegetable crops um, was, was wonderful. And then when I, went into the job market and, um, and and was testing the waters and then wound up in cranberries for 24 years. I mean, it's in, which was unique because that's farming in a wetland, wetland ecosystem, which, which is kind of a tricky thing with trying to, trying to grow and maintain things like water quality and, and uh, we we evolved to a point we are great at being able to manage crop in an environmentally compatible way but like i said it was time to you know, eventually move on and that's when i wound up with cooperative extension and now um the the big thing when i joined extension was when my opened i mean i'd heard of one disease when I was in I didn't renew my growers, but I, I didn't understand probably to the full extent. And when I started doing workshops and talking to people, a lot of people mm. uh, here for tickets, and then I started hearing the horror stories horror stories about tick borne diseases and being sick for you know, a year, couple years, five years, ten years, six mm -hmm. for twenty years, and they're so frustrated because they they don't know what's going on and they don't know how to get help. And and I saw that the what I can do is let's prevent that tick bite in the first place, so nobody has to go through this. Because uh, right. once you get into that arena, you you don't know you don't know the outcome, and that that should be kind of scary. And there are things right. from the standpoint of um, prevention. So, so our, our program is a, a, a sort of program. I'm just many people as I can through uh, various media. You know, so live in-person workshops. Um, work with the media closely. Um, you are a phenomenal opportunity for me to get our message points out. So uh, it's yeah. a it's a constant. Uh, dialogue that I now have with many people. Yeah, I think it's amazing what you're doing, Larry. Um, I remember when I met you, I was I went to a group meeting with Central Mass Lyme Foundation, which is what I started to go to all their group meetings. And you know, if you've never seen my program before, I'm a Lyme disease advocate. I've gone to many, many meetings for them in Massachusetts. I'm in North Carolina now, um, but I, I just commend you for all the workshops you're doing and teaching people how to prevent Lyme disease. You and I talked the other day, you know, I see people rolling around on the grass over here and stuff. And I'm, I think to myself, do they have anything on to prevent a tick bite? Probably not. They probably don't even think about it. I mean, they're all dressed up. It's a restaurant right aside of it. And, you know, they're all dressed up to the nines going to this expensive mm -hmm. restaurant. I'm on a lake. It's beautiful here. You know, and I'm like, you know, these kids, they're young. They're just rolling in the grass. I'm sure they're not thinking of putting on some deet or something, you know, rolling in the grass. I, don't, I, I guarantee you that. So we need to educate. So with that, Larry, um, considering, let's talk about some of the things people don't think about 
even with, you know, with ticks and prevention. So considering the mild winters that we've had, what is the likelihood of an increased tick population this year? And what are experts predicting? You were telling me it's a little bit different for the South as it is for like New England or Massachusetts. Sure. In the Northeast, in the upper central Midwest, I mean, uh, overall, we had a mild winter across the board. And, uh, and, and I, I normally get calls in the spring from the media like, Larry, what's the tick for when tick season started? I say, you know, and I, and I say, well, it, it started. It, it, it never ends, right. actually. Um, right. So it, it's 365 days a year. In terms of um, whether this is the year of the tick apocalypse, I I take a, a kind of a it, let's let's look at this from a scientific standpoint. Mild weather does not create a tick population, uh, and and the idea that even if you get a cold winter, you know it'll kill off a number of ticks. Ticks actually the cold weather, even really cold weather. Uh, like when I was traveling to Wisconsin uh, as a cranberry scientist, I mean, in Wisconsin, 25 below zero, you know, happens all the time out there. And in Wisconsin, ticks are it, are quite healthy and Wisconsin's quite endemic for Lyme disease. So even in our worst winters here in the Northeast, Paula, the, the ticks are not impacted. They actually synthesize a chemical called glycerol. Well, these guys make antifreeze. OK, so not only they make antifreeze, they're under, you know, tucked under the snow. So they're insulated. So they're they're fine. So what I tell people in the media is that in order for us to have the tick apocalypse, that would have been uh, due to events that would have happened two years ago. If we had a huge tick population rolling over us. It would have been because we had a phenomenally large acorn crop two years ago, which would have made the uh, mouse and chipmunk populations and other rodents spike last year. And that would have led to an increase in tick populations this year. But but acorn, acorn crops go up and down. And so we, what we see in our surveillance is tick populations vary year on year, but not they don't oscillate like here and, and like down mm -hmm. there. It's more of a matter of prevailing environmental conditions that allow them to be active. So so whenever you get temperatures above freezing, and there's no snow cover. Yeah, ticks are active. Um, if you get periods in the summer where it gets very dry and the humidity is low, you're going to have lower exposure risk because the ticks are down in the leaf litter trying to stay hydrated. They, they desiccate. Deer ticks desiccate quite quickly. Hmm. And then if you get, you know, rain and humidity going up, that's the ticks will be more active. So, but the, I tell people that tick season starts January 1st, goes to December 31st. And so when the, when the environmental conditions are favorable, yeah, tick activity. And here in Massachusetts uh, and, and in workshops, I, I show people the case data. And if you look at cases of Lyme disease by month, you see cases of Lyme disease in the Northeast, January, February, March, mm. April, all the way to December. But um, the bulk of the cases are during the summer months, So, right. um, which is what we're coming into right now. So 85% uh, mm. of the cases occur during the summer, but it's it's um, all throughout the year. It's so right, yeah. it's not going to be an apocalypse. It's mild winters. It just means the ticks were more active earlier. People were, you know, taking advantage of the nice weather in the early spring, getting outside. So they're they're surprised that you know um, that they're out there in March and they're getting tick bites. So it's it's more right. of a matter of um, people activity. <laughs> than anything else right so there tell people how they can I, i've talked about it on other shows but some people might be watching that i've never watched before how can they prevent a um, tick from being on them or what's tick prevention tell us, give sure. us yeah sure uh, we've constructed our program in a three-phase plan paula um, mm -hmm. protect yourself, protect your yard, 
and protect mm. your pet. Okay, so we got all three of those things to consider. In terms of personal protection, uh, you have to be mindful if you're going to be in a tick environment. And, and, and this is something that if you look at, like, the, say, the CDC website, you know, Tick Habitat, they all those sites will show you um, a trail going into the woods, like in a state park or a state forest. And, and you don't have to go to, a, you know, open open space like a state park to get a tick bite. Uh, surveillance uh, information that was obtained in Connecticut showed that two-thirds of the people that were submitting ticks for identification and testing got them from their own backyards. So ticks and gardening are the perfect marriage. So you don't have to go into a, a state park to get a tick bite. You can get, you know, easily in your backyard. Right. And so, I, you know, if you know you're going to be in a tick environment um, and it's not, you know, the middle of your lawn, deer ticks don't, you know, um, that habitat, direct sunlight, short grass, they don't survive there. But you get to the edge where there's, you know, like um, partial shade, leaf litter, you know, trees transition of bushes and shade trees so you get lower temperatures higher humidity that's where you're going to find these deer ticks so you just have to be mindful of that so if you are going into a tick environment it's certainly recommended you know the long pants tucked into your socks yeah uh, it looks dorky but it's effective keeps the tick on the exterior of your garment um, but people during the summer like to wear shorts and stuff like that. And, and so even if you're wearing shorts, um, wearing proper shoes and socks is, is important. Um, and wearing light colors makes it easier to see the ticks. Um, I tell people when you come in from a outdoor activity, first thing you do is um, to get ready to do a tick check is throw your clothes in the dryer for 20 minutes. Yeah. That's all it takes to kill any tick steering. You don't have to throw them in a hot water wash and then put them in the dryer forever. Just 20 minutes in the dryer, enough. And then that's an opportunity to, uh, what you should be doing is a tick check. And as, as a lot of people experience, ticks can get in some funny places. So the, right. the typical places are, well, on your hip, around your neck or behind your knee, but you got to think about between your toes, your your pelvic area, under your arms. Mm -hmm. So they they any any tight um, any tight places where clothing becomes restrictive is a place where you normally you're going to find a tick. But you can basically find them anywhere. And uh, the stages of the tick, you know, if you were going to create a search image you know what should i looking for i tell people when you do a tick check using your fingertips is probably the best way to do a tick check is you you feel around and feel you know where you come across a bump where you never had it before uh -huh. um so your fingertips are very good at tick checks but in terms of size um the adult stage of the deer tick that's out from September till there's still some out about now. They're about the size. If you look at um, seeds on a bagel, sesame seeds. So an adult stage deer tick is about the size of a sesame seed. But the nymph stage of the tick that started, especially with this mild weather up here, started coming out, you know, two to three weeks ago. And they'll be with us until mid-August. And those things are the size of a pot. Okay, so something really tiny with eight legs, a bad attitude that can plant you on your butt for a very, very long time. So looking for something the size of a seed is a challenge. Uh, so that's why we see 85% of all tick-borne diseases in the Northeast occurring during the summer months when that nymph stage is active. Okay, so, so we got, you know, proper clothing, proper footwear. And then, um, then you think about repellents as a first line defense, and yeah. repellents—that's the best, the best tool we have in the box. And people, you know, are confused. It's like, you know, people read, you know, they should be using a bug spray. Well, that's a little bit too general of a recommendation. Repellents that are for skin, so like products like off 
or products that contain DEET or alternatives to DEET like picaridin or oil of lemon eucalyptus. And those are for treating your exposed skin. And uh, it, it, what that means is the tick won't bite you where the repellent is, but it just might oh. keep walking along until it finds a place where there's no repellent. But but those type of products are very good for, for exposed skin. What, what I found and really drive home to people is that there, there's a repellent to treat clothing, okay? So um, shirts even, but pants and socks and, and footwear, and it contains the active ingredient permethrin, okay? Yeah. And what I found is that, you know, you see casual references to this in a lot of extension literature or or um, media writings like, oh yeah, you can get, you know, treat clothing with permethrin. It's kind of like, you know, okay, have, have a nice day. But what does that mean? Well, when I started doing research with permethrin to see, okay, what does this bug spray really do? What I found, Paula, is that if a tick gets on a treated fabric surface for 60 seconds, one minute, that tick is guaranteed to die, okay? And as Martha says, that's a good thing. And, <laughs> and, and it, the tick might not die in 60 seconds, but it's it's impaired. You can see it, you know, uncoordinated walking and, and stuff. But that tick, five minutes later, it might be dead. You know, it might take 10 minutes, a little bit longer. But but the outcome is absolutely guaranteed. And, and so that is the most effective tool in the box. And when I turn people onto this, Paula... Um, and then they go outside into a tick infested environment. Um, they they will get back to me and say, Larry, this this stuff is magic. And uh, the biggest problem we had on Cape Cod was finding product. So um, I met with all the owners or managers of the major garden centers on Cape Cod. And now they're all stocking product. And oh, wow. when I go in and do store checks and talk about, you know, how are sales going? And in in recent years, the product is flying off the shelf. So the word is getting out and a lot of people, lot of people are on to this, which is a really good thing. And and then you have to address the elephant in the room, okay? Because Larry Dapsis, entomologist that we trust, is telling me to put my kids in clothing yeah. treated with a synthetic chemical pesticide right. and am, is larry a crazy guy well i'm not <laughs> um and, and the way i look at it is well a little bit crazy but uh, <laughs> nobody dresses like this other than me um, <laughs> right. but um if you look at the statistic kids under the age of 10 have the highest incidence rate of lyme disease in the state of massachusetts and i'm sure that's the same uh for and every other area where Lyme exists. And then and then there's a, a second spike of um, incidence rate for people in their, you know, 60 and older. So, so younger people and older people. And so I tell people that these data show me a lot of things that, that it shows me that everything parents have been doing up to this point in time, it's not working. Okay, so let's think about our game plan. And right. in terms of permethrin, it, it, Paul, this is really a psychological barrier. You know, it's a chemical as opposed yeah. to a barrier because it's a toxic substance. And so right. to put some perspective on it for people, um, I walk through the toxicity and, and, and the ins and outs, like what's the exposure risk of this chemical? And, and, and so if you go through everything, the bottom line is that, and this is from... EPA, their conclusion is that permethrin-treated clothing poses no, no harm to infants, children, pregnant women, and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the National Research Council that studied long-term exposure, like people wearing permethrin-treated everything, you know, 18 hours a day, every single day for 10 years. And when they rolled up that aggregate exposure, they saw no reason to expect an adverse effect. So, so Paula, when I look at what I think is really a low amount of risk for permethrin exposure, and I weigh that against the consequences of one of these tick-borne diseases, 
and Lyme oh, yeah. is just one of them. For for me, that is easy, easy math. Um, so right. parents should not hesitate to be using this uh, to protect their kids. It's it's what we need to do. Yeah, they don't see the big picture. They, you know, even myself, I didn't know a few years back what Lyme disease even was, let alone what you know chronic Lyme was or any of that. So they just don't sure. know. And it's hard. It's hard to. Yeah, it's hard to even diagnose in a kid. How how do you how do you ask a kid if they their joints are feeling arthritic? I mean, they mm -hmm. they've they've never ex they don't know what you're talking about. Um, right. So that, that's and so kids are are an important uh, component of of protection. And here on Cape Cod, we have a a much older demographic. I mean, there's a lot of retired people here on Cape Cod, and so um, our population population is a, a higher average age than compared to the rest of the state. So so we have, you know, not only Lyme that they're susceptible to, but babesiosis and aplasmosis are also transmitted by deer ticks. Um, most of those cases occur in people 60 and older. And here on Cape Cod, we in our surveillance research, we see a certain degree of co-infection. About 10% of the ticks are packing more than one bug, and you can get more than one of these diseases at the same time. So permethrin treated clothing and footwear year round. Um, so so to that end, we actually um, uh, scripted and produced a 10 part video series on everything you need to know about tick biology diseases and, and how to get ticks tested and repellents. So if you go to our website, capecod.gov, capecod.gov forward slash ticks, um, there'll be a playlist for all 10 videos. And one of our videos is on permethrin treated clothing and footwear. And hands down, it's it's a, it's packed with really solid information to a point where okay. the Appalachian Mountain contacted me last year that they're using our permethrin video as in-house training tool because it's so good so so our information on our website it's available to anyone and mm -hmm. um, i'm also a i'm an available resource call me i'm open okay. to business. Yeah, I'll check that out so larry we're just going to go to a brief commercial and we'll be right back okay will do commercial for uh, Paula Resende is our monthly supporter and sponsor from Tree Nut Supplements. That's a probiotic. And what that does is it digests the food that we can't digest. <laughs> so it's a little hard to see in the video, but in that pudding, it's breaking down all the different like carbs and fats and proteins. So it's really helpful for people with if they have gut issues and a lot of people with autoimmune issues, Lyme disease, have gut issues. So you want a probiotic. So let me know if that's something you need help with um, and I will hook you up with Paula. So Larry, we were talking about, um, you started to talk about the co-infections and one of the ones you mentioned was babesiosis, um, which some people are probably like, what did he just say? <laughs> What is that called? So um, the CDC <laughs> recently posted. It's one, yep. it's one of those one of those Scrabble words. Right? <laughs> so the CDC recently posted about a significant rise in babesiosis. Um, so tell the people a little bit about 
help them understand what the heck is it all about co-infections. Like you've got Lyme disease, but there's also infections that come under the umbrella of Lyme disease and babesiosis is one of them. So tell the people a little bit about that. Sure. So, so deer ticks, um, th there's, there's, we now know of five different pathogens they can transmit um, to people that make them sick. So, so we have Lyme by far and away is the most prevalent, but Babesio. And after a while, Paula just kind of rolls off the tongue. Um, but anaplasmosis, relapsing fever, and mm -hmm. and Powassan virus. Um, yeah, the CDC. Uh, there was a lot of media coverage lately that there's been a 25% increase in the amount of babesiosis out. Well, we don't know so much about that type in Cape Cod for a number of reasons, but mm -hmm. it's it's not, babesiosis is not new to us. In fact, the first case of babesiosis in the United States was diagnosed in 1959 on Nantucket. So basically, you know, Cape Cod. And so we've we've known about this organism, and and it's it's a player here. I know people have had it and had it, you know, sometimes, you know, with Lyme, and uh, babesiosis. Uh, it 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 can land you in the hospital in a heartbeat. Uh, this is like it's really kind of like getting malaria, and so you know your your plate counts will drop like a rock off a cliff. And um, and and it, unlike Lyme, it can be directly fatal. And we see Babesia um, infected ticks uh, in about ten or twelve percent of the tick population. Uh, so it's out there, and it's and it's significant. So what the CDC was announcing was the fact that they're now just getting around to surveillance. And so when you when you go out and measure something, that you might find it. And that's what the CDC is discovering is that it's it's um it was there. It looks like an increase, but because if you start it, you're not measuring it, and now all of a sudden you look. Um, it may have been out there at a low level, and now it's 25 percent more. It's just you you're you're looking for it, and uh, so the way the data are being collected in Massachusetts now is is different. So we don't have insight into number of cases it's um mm -hmm. uh, our state department of health is recording a uh, number of visits to an emergency room due to um a tick bite and then discharge with what looks like maybe a tick-borne disease so we've lost some visibility but the argument is that the data that were being reported from doctors was flawed it's 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 way underreported in the cdc you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they may cite there's, you know, 35,000 cases a year, but people in the know um, believe that, it's, okay, it's more like 350,000 cases a year or more. So it's 10 times underreported. So wow. that's, that's why Massachusetts has taken a, a different tact on, on uh, reportable infectious disease like, as far as tick-borne stuff goes. But um, at, when the data were being gathered, um, I was uh, contacted by a person at Harvard School of Medicine, and they basically were looking at trends of Lyme disease, and they were baffled when they got to Barnstable County, Cape Cod. And, and um, then they realized or found out that we have a very aggressive education program and Dr. David Scale contacted me. He said, Larry, <clears throat> whatever you're doing, keep doing it because Barnstable County is the only county in the state where the incidence rate of Lyme was not increasing. So, so we're out there, but people, people are listening to us. We've got, you know, core messages like treated clothing and footwear and mm -hmm. people, people are responding and, and we can see it in the data. And, you know, just going back to the treated clothing, too, I would say, you know, if you if anybody's out there listening or you share this with somebody, you, type of people that would really, really need that are people that go hiking all the time. You're people sure. that uh, landscapers, construction people, um, you know, people that are outdoors all the time working outside. Um that's what I would, you know, besides kids, just, you know, adults that are always outside and working and, 
you know, that, that putting that clothing on is going to beat trying to spray yourself with off or some other type of stuff all the time, you know, so. Or, yeah, you know, or, those, or people oh, tend yeah. to look at those all natural products and, and all natural, you know, it sounds good. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're kind of embracing something. It's, it's all natural. It's effective and safe. And, and unfortunately, Paula, for this area, um, the all natural products that have like botanical oils and whatnot, they're totally ineffective as, as personal protection or yard sprays. And to a point you just made that was completely valid, like who's at risk? Well, I I have talked, I've spoken before the Cape Cod Landscape Association and mm -hmm. different gar gardening group partners, um, yeah. garden clubs, outdoor sporting group clubs. Um, so so uh, yeah, there's there's all kinds of groups that we try and uh, touch on. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of people don't, you know, they just don't think about it. They do their jobs every day, especially like construction workers. They wouldn't think about it. But if they're going in and there, there's a lot of, you know, land that has to be cleared or whatever, there could be ticks in there. Yeah, you so know? I've spoken before, Department, you know, DPW crews and our Mosquito mm -hmm. Association, which is always out there, our AmeriCorps program uh so so we there's there's lots of people that day to day they have exposure risk and so we try and we try and help so let's talk about a little bit um couple things one talk about how if a person how a person can safely remove a tick that first of all and then talk about the testing of the tick versus the testing of a person once they got bitten. I know you can't talk too much about medical, um, but just a little general there. And full disclosure, this is not medical advice or any scientific, you know, nutrition advice. Not medical, not meant to heal, treat, or cure any illness on here. Just full disclosure there. But just um, a little information, like you know, if they test the tick, it seems like they can test it for more than the actual person faster. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Good call. <clears throat> so in the event you are bitten by a tick uh there's uh, internet is wonderful and social media but but the problem is bad information right. flies fast and far so i'm always correcting misinformation that's out there right. so in terms of getting bitten by ticks you know you see the you know the old wives recommendations you know, like the dish detergent or the vaseline yes. you know, so that the tick will eventually back itself out the problem with that paula is the longer that tick is attached just means that it gives the tick more time to transmit one of these bugs into you so there's a, a lag time so for like like lyme disease we have a 24-hour rule of thumb mm -hmm. if the tick is attached to you for less than 24 hours, the chances of getting Lyme are reduced. You know, it's not zero, but it's reduced. And after 24 hours, risk of transmission goes up. And it's the same for, you know, things like babesiosis and anaplasmosis. Mm -hmm. They're 24 hour plus or minus. The exception being Powassan virus, the transmission time is 15 minutes. So, so oh. in the event you want to get a tick out of you quickly, um, it's push, that's all you need, or that's what you should, should have. And you just grab that, that head, you know, take as close to your skin as you can get, just gently pull straight up. And in the event you see something left behind, a lot of people assume the head's embedded in there and it's a disaster. Well, um, mm. ticks have a mouth part, right? And if you pull it too hard, the beak breaks off. And that's the only mm -hmm. part that's in you. And that doesn't transmit in, um, it doesn't contain the pathogens. It's like a soda straw. <clears throat> so, okay. so if you see that left behind, it's a little, little neosporic and dissolve two days. It's like a, a wood splinter. Um, but so, so you just grab that tick, pull it, and, and then what to do with it? Well, um, a lot of people, you know, <laughs> will flush that tick or dispose of it, you know, some other way. They burn might it. burn it or tape yeah. it to an index card, 
put it on their refrigerator as a little tick morgue. Yeah, people have their own way of, you know, uh, imparting justice. So like you did this to me, I'm going to take action. But I think you can get that fun. tick tested. <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot of people take out, you know, ra <laughs> rage on, on, on a tick mm -hmm. uh, that they removed. Um, but you can go and send it to a lab like at UMass Amherst. Uh, there's yeah. there's a lab there, and they can test that tick for all the pathogens it was potentially uh, exposing you to. So so the lab we use is um, at UMass Amherst, and it's called TickReport.com, and it's, yeah. and so a basic DNA panel test, which runs fifty bucks, um, will test for the bugs that cause not only Lyme, but Babesia, um, Anaplasma, and Relapsing Fever, which are the dominant ones we have. Um, and, and so once they receive that tick, you're going to get that report in three business days or less. Very quick turnaround. Right. And what you were talking about, you know, people getting a blood test for Lyme disease, how accurate is that versus getting a tick tested? Right. Well, the, the, the test, the human tests for Lyme disease, uh, you can get false positives, you can get right. false negatives, you can take the test at the wrong time. So it's it's it, there's a lot of ins and outs to testing a person for Lyme disease. But for this tick test, um, this technique is 99.9% .9 accurate. So if it says that tick is packing the bug that causes Lyme, uh, it is is that's the deal right. uh, so so tick testing is extremely accurate and so for a patient it's actually good because you have solid data that right. you can now if you're not feeling good and now you can have a conversation with your primary or or your kids doctor um you can say hey my kid was bitten by a tick say three weeks ago and it's not feeling good or i'm not feeling good and this tick that we pulled off um had this, this, then maybe even this, because we've seen scared pathogens. And so for a doctor that's really kind of willing to, you know, open their minds a little bit, and and Cape Cod doctors, they're they're getting they're getting there. Um it, initially it was like, you know, tick test, what does that tell me? Well, it tells you what your patient potentially was exposed to, so that now you can look at your patient and hopefully start looking at what should be, you know, part of the clinical profile or the, you know, for what, what um, is before you. And so I'm happy to report that um, some people have told me that there are some doctors in response to getting, you know, a call from a person that got a tick bite, they say, I'm not going to do anything until I see the tick report. And I think that's good news is that doctors yeah. are now taking these data and utilizing them, which is really, really good. That is good news. That is good news. Yeah, I just really wanted to address that because who would think if you test a bug or yeah. a tick that it would just be so much simpler than having to go through all these tests yourself. It just kind of saves that person from a lot of things that they don't need necessarily if that tick gets tested. Sure. And if, if the tick test comes back negative, as long as that was the only tick on you, right. if, that tick, if that comes back negative, that's a peace of mind, Paula. That's the peace of mind. Absolutely. So let's talk um, quickly. We only have about five minutes, but just some quick myths. Like there's um, deer ticks and dog ticks. What can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, dog ticks are very common here um, in the Northeast. And dog ticks, um, I consider them more of an annoyance than a real health threat here. Um, they can transmit the bug that causes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, uh, okay. which in my 12 years here in extension, we've had one case of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Down where you are, you know, Virginia, North Carolina, Rocky Mountain is much more common in southern states. So dog ticks down in your area, dog ticks are, you know, they're they're more of an important part of the landscape as well as deer ticks. 
Um, but up here, you know, I tell people, you know, okay, it's a dog tick. Um, and and only deer ticks can transmit that pathogen that causes Lyme. So one of That's the myths a- out there is that, you know, I get Lyme disease from a mosquito or I get it from a flea because research shows that that pathogen that causes Lyme has been found in mosquitoes and fleas and lice and spiders. And, and just because you find something like pathogen like Lyme in a bug like a mosquito does not equate to it being a successful vector. So yeah, people have find this bacteria in the mosquito, but it can't transmit that pathogen, okay? There, and there's all kinds of complex biochemical reasons why that occurs. So, so this disease that causes Lyme is specialized for this deer tick. So, so we have deer ticks and five different diseases up here, dog ticks that we consider more of an annoyance. And the newest player we have up here, but very, very common down south is the Lone Star tick. And we started buying this on Cape Cod um, about a year after I came on board. So about we've had 11 years now and it's, it's, it's found a good home on Cape Cod. It likes it here. And, uh, and so we're 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 keeping an eye on it, and uh, people are getting bitten. And and there are some diseases that can transmit, and and one of them is um, called Starry it's a type of rash disease with flu-like symptoms. So we I know we've had some people with Lone Star tick bites diagnosed with Starry and, and successfully treated. But the game changer with Lone Star tick is the bite of a lone star tick can trigger an allergy to red meat consumption. Yes. Which can be as mild as hives, but all the way to anaphylactic shock. And I know that there are cases of this red meat allergy that has occurred here on the Cape. And so it's a very complex food allergy. In fact, um, one of the places that's doing the, the best research, uh, the a focal point of it is down at the University of North Carolina, Paula, right in your backyard. Dr. Scott, Dr. Scott Cummins is doing a lot of work on this um, uh, meat allergy. And it's not just beef, but it's, you know, pork and lamb and even beef derived uh products like gelatin but even now that allergic response has been extended to high fat dairy product like ice cream and i don't know you paula but i imagine being able to eat ice cream uh for a long time if i was bitten by a lone star tick so so that tick is um Found a nice home here on Cape Cod and is and is uh, on the increase. So we've got three different players here, but Lone Star uh, here and down through the southern states, very very common. So uh, one other question that just came to mind um, when you were talking about dog ticks, I was thinking about horses. So what kind of ticks are attracted to horses? Uh, deer ticks quite common on horses. In fact, okay. um, be behind people uh in terms of pets in Lyme uh dogs dogs are very susceptible to Lyme disease and ironically there is a vaccine for Lyme for your dogs but not for people yet <laughs> Pfizer has one in, in the works maybe years down the road uh mm. but you can get a vaccine for your poop but uh, it, it it shows up in horses and goats uh so so you have to be mindful of you know, your, your big pets as well as your smaller pets. Right. Well, we got about one minute left. So tell everybody once again where they can reach you, um, whether you have email or website, whatever, phone number, what, whatever easiest way for people to reach you. If yeah, they the even easy, want you. Yeah, yeah, the easiest way to look for information that we've posted is on our website. And again, it's Cape Cod dot gov g o v and forward slash ticks and that'll take you to our tick and insect page and okay. again we have the the video series it's it's 90 minutes of material in like 10 little buckets so mm-hmm. you can make yourself some popcorn pop yeah, I mean, and, yeah. and you, get a, you get a lot of information and as a bonus track paula um a documentary was made about me 
in in our efforts here yeah it's called kick days an independent filmmaker followed me around for about a year and this documentary showed in about in a number of major film festivals so wow. I'm, quite, I'm quite proud of that so uh that's on our website as well it's called tick days mm -hmm. uh, and then and for further questions my my contact information is on our website okay well, this has been fascinating. Um, you know, I'm just going to sum up a couple of things because I think it's a lot of information for everybody. But I think you really uh, helped us with some myths. You know, like a lot of people talk about other insects can carry Lyme. You mentioned it can carry it, but it can't transport it. So that's huge. That's really good to know. Talking about the chemicals and the clothing, a lot of people are concerned about that. You address that, you know, like what's worse, being ill the rest of your life <laughs> from sure. a tick bite, you know, and trying to pay for all this medicine and herbs and whatever it takes to get well, or to just wear this chemical that has a low exposure rate. So, you, you know, you gave a scientific backed evidence, which is huge. I mean, I can tell people till I'm blue in the face, but I didn't have that scientific evidence. So that's huge. Um, and then just talking about, you know, the, the dog ticks versus the deer ticks. The deer ticks are attracted to the um, horses, which that's what's, trans, you know, the deer ticks are transporting the line. So I think we really addressed a lot of myths that people did, weren't aware of. Um, and, and especially, oh, especially, I, I see this all the time on Facebook, the, um, like putting the dishwashing liquid, uh, the Vaseline, different things on the tick. What I was told, and I, you can probably tell me this too, is, um, it can aggravate the tick too to put that stuff on there, so it's gonna bite harder. I don't know. That's a that's a myth as well. That's yeah. A little okay. an, anthropomorphic is that you you read don't agitate the tick because it'll throw up. Well, yeah. tick, tick so plumbing doesn't work like that. It's you, you, they're not gonna you can't make them mad and they throw up and and get you. So it's take that off the table as well. Okay, but it's it's good for people to know. And one last tip that I've mentioned on another show too, I have a friend that goes hiking all the time. He uses a um, sticky roller to roll over all of himself before he even goes inside. So he gets a lot of the ticks on the sticky roller. Yep. That's <laughs> so a good that's idea. Cool. Yep. Yeah. So Larry, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to us tonight. Um, and I'm just so appreciative. I, I mean, I've learned a lot. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, once again, I want to thank my sponsor, my monthly supporter, Paula Resendez. If you guys need some good quality supplements, if you have an autoimmune illness, not just Lyme or, you know, just not feeling so great, you want to check out her supplements. They're really good quality. I would recommend them. We have, you know, really good stuff. So you can go back and watch some of the uh, replays to see a little bit more about the supplements. And I'm looking forward to more monthly sponsors, daily sponsors, business spotlight people, um, and people that um, need my services because you might need recipes, <laughs> and people for the show. If you've overcome an illness or going through an illness, I need you. People need your stories. So thank you again, Larry. Thank you, everyone. We will see you next Sunday. Good night, everybody.